There's nothing like the first day of spring to lift your spirits. My name is Stefano, and I'm starting my adult life all over again. I rattled my wheeled suitcase down the jetway and rolled it into the less crowded than usual airport lobby. It had only been a year since the international economy had collapsed. Last spring was just awful for me. I lost my job, Lynn left me, and then, just a few weeks apart, my grandparents died. On top of all the woes, my dwindling finances could no longer allow me to keep my home. Starting a new life with a new job in another city was just what I needed. I was even luckier to be hired for the job when many of my friends were still searching unsuccessfully. My new company paid my living expenses for two weeks, after which I was on my own. After getting to know my new co-workers, I later had to fill out a folder with a bunch of forms from HR. Once all the paperwork was signed, I went back to the hotel and plumped down on my bed with no energy. Not many people stayed at this small hotel, and the staff did their best to make me feel welcome. I strongly suspect that for them, too, this year was the hardest year of their lives. The two weeks flew by. It was so nice to feel needed again. I found myself a cozy apartment just two miles from my office. I enjoyed walking to and from work on what seemed like over 300 days a year. After coming here from a colder climate, the bright sunshine and gentle breezes were a welcome change for me. Taking only a bag of groceries and the wheeled suitcase that followed me off the plane, I checked out of the hotel and moved into my new habitat. It was a good thing I didn't own my own car, since there were no free parking spaces around anyway. Even the curbs around my apartment building were full of cars. The economy forced people to double or even triple the population of their apartments. In these times of crisis, it was not unusual for six or even ten people to live in a two-bedroom apartment. So being alone in my cramped two-bedroom apartment made me feel like a real king. For reasons I couldn't explain to myself, I was magnetically drawn to this particular apartment. Perhaps it was the wonderful view from my bedroom window of the nearby pond and the densely wooded park surrounding it. On the fourth floor, and without a balcony, I felt safe, leaving my bedroom window open. The window itself lacked a screen, which I had pointed out in my detailed inspection report to the property manager before I moved in. Coming from a colder climate, I still couldn't get used to the constant air conditioning, so I hardly used the existing AC. This four-story building had been built probably 50 years ago. There were not enough outlets in the rooms, but I made do with extension cords. When I returned home on the first Friday of my new job, I found a bird sitting on the refrigerator in my apartment. A real live bird, about 13 centimeters tall. It had an almost entirely yellow body, black wings, and the same black tuft on the front of its head. As I came closer, the bird fluttered up, flew across the room and clawed at the edge of the curtain rod with its little claws, tilting its head and peering at me with its shiny, beady eyes. After a few more equally unsuccessful attempts, I gave up chasing her. Well, fine. If I have to share my living space, this bird would probably be a good choice for a roommate. As a gesture of reconciliation, I poured and placed a small saucer of water on the kitchen table. As soon as I was no longer perceived as a threat, the yellow and black bird fluttered off the ledge and then, rustling its wings, swooped down onto the table and helped itself to the fresh water. After opening my laptop and surfing the net for a while, I tentatively determined that my new feathered friend and roommate was an American dandy. The only difference between the online photo and the chigger strutting across my desk was that the live bird had a noticeable small black tuft about a half inch below the beak. That's just right, I thought. I'll call her Goldie. By the way, was it a he or a she? With the kind of agile maneuverability Goldie had already demonstrated, I certainly didn't have a chance to look around to see who it was. To hell with it, Goldie's name fits both ways, but no matter what, this bird is she to me. Good thing I still didn't have a roommate. I suddenly caught myself talking to Goldie while I was minding my own business. If I inadvertently got too close, Goldie would scuttle off to a safe corner. When I woke up the next morning, Goldie was gone. I left the window open just in case and went for a run. When I returned, Goldie was already waiting for me. Well, 
If she was going to stay, I might as well see what should or shouldn't be in her daily diet. Back to the internet. Yep, that's right. And then off to the pet store. From what I've read, Goldie should like sunflower, thistle, and elm seeds. I'll have to give a kiss goodbye to my wasted money if Goldie is suddenly not there when I get back. Hooray. Not only was she waiting for me at home, but thank goodness she loved the seeds I brought from the store. But what about her love for me? That remained to be seen. For now, Goldie always kept a safe distance from me. Sunday morning, still not fully awake from my half-sleep, I thought someone was looking at me. When I opened my eyes, I found Goldie, just a few feet away on the bedside table, scrutinizing me with one eye and the other. Without making a sound, we stared at each other. Why? I don't even know. When I got tired of the staring game and closed my eyelids, Goldie chirped angrily, which made me open my eyes again. Apparently, she was training me that way because all we did was stare at each other again. Thirty seconds later, Goldie chirped something and flew out of the bedroom. It was time to get up. I showered, shaved, and dressed lightly. Goldie was nowhere to be seen. Her seed saucer was empty, so I put in another small spoonful for her. I also refreshed her water before leaving the apartment. During my morning run, I noticed and heard a few American chirps fluttering and chirping around among the trees. Of course, I wondered if one of those yellow and black birds was my Goldie. As I shifted into a springy stride and cooled down little by little, I met some of my housemates, including a few curious women. Three of them were ladies about my age, and their names were Nancy, Laura, and Josie. A new neighbor who was also passionate about keeping fit and healthy had obviously piqued their interest. We didn't get to the point of exchanging phone numbers, but the next time we met, I would cast my fishing rod into this promising pond. Day after day went by, and little by little, Goldie accepted me. It was two weeks after we met when she first ventured to land on my head. At that moment, I was busy sitting at my laptop answering emails. My new job was pretty stressful, and I didn't have time to even think about my social life. Goldie sat on my head like that until I started fidgeting too much, at which point she fluttered up and landed on her favorite curtain rod. Many times when I woke up in the morning, I found Goldie with her head tilted on her side, silently watching me from the bedside table. I chirped falsely at her once, and she chirped something long and chirpy back at me. God, I hope I didn't say something obscene in dapper language to Goldie. During my runs around the pond and through the park, I occasionally heard a familiar chirp, but it could have been any of the birds scurrying back and forth. Thanks to my morning runs, I was also able to keep in touch with the ladies in the neighborhood. With a few of them, I eventually exchanged email addresses and phone numbers. Laura was a very shy young lady who blushed whenever I merely looked in her direction. Over casual conversation, Nancy and Josie told me more about themselves and their lives, but unlike them, Laura kept personal information private. Six weeks into my new life, I had a date with one of the ladies I met in the food court next to the office. She worked at the bank branch next door. Donna pursued me even more than I pursued her. Still, it was my first date since moving in. I stuttered and stammered as I tried to hold a conversation with her, though she didn't seem to pay much attention to my embarrassment. Donna was a sweet girl, but a little too pushy, clearly anxious to get into her wedding dress as soon as possible. And that wasn't something I was interested in right now. When I walked into the apartment after the date, Goldie chirped at me indignantly as if I'd missed my established curfew. I chirped back at her. During my regular weekend run, I ran into the neighborhood ladies again. One of Laura's older friends had given me the phone number of this shy girl. If feminine glances could turn a woman upside down, all that would be left of this friend of Laura's would be an outline on the ground circled in chalk. Laura herself blushed desperately as I immediately dialed the number I'd been told. Her phone had a notable ringtone on it that I recognized. It was a Taylor Swift song. A few more weeks later, I had a date with Chrissy. She worked in the back office of a brokerage firm located on the first floor of my office building. I met her in the lobby as we both waited out a brief downpour inside. Although I didn't think the date had gone well, Chrissy insisted on stopping by to see my apartment. When we walked in, Goldie was sitting on her favorite curtain rod just watching us. 
Chrissy didn't stay with me long. I got the impression that she was a material girl and that I had failed the unspoken test. Something about a lonely guy having wild birds living in his apartment uninvited scared her away. Not five seconds after Chrissy left, Goldie, who had been silent the whole time, began to voice her chirpy complaints to me. I'm sorry, Goldie, I know it's my fault, I said, raising my hands in haste to repent. I see your food plate is empty. I promise I won't let it happen again. But in response, indignant chirp, 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 chirp continued to fall from the eaves on my poor head. I was being openly scolded, and I only hoped that Goldie had learned some foul language for young dapper girls. At the end of each of her angry rants, she waved her tail feathers as if she were making an exclamation point. In the morning, wiping my eyes from sleep, I felt a small sticky spot on my forehead. Looking at myself in the mirror, I saw that it was bird shit. Goldie, what the fuck? I yelled at my feathered roommate. Chark, chark, chark. The saboteur didn't stay in debt, flicking her tail in my direction from a safe ledge. I told you I'm sorry. It won't happen again, I promised conciliatorily. Goldie raised her beak, turned away, and hopped on her ledge, defiantly ignoring me. She made no secret of her displeasure with me, and I wondered if she'd still be here when I got home from work. Just in case, I made sure to leave a full plate of seeds and a saucer of fresh water for the wayward beauty. As time went on, things returned to normal for Goldie and me. She waited in the mornings for me to wake up and only occasionally chirped at me. Even though I had only started at my new job a few months ago, I was already training some of the new employees. This, of course, left me little time to do my own work, so I was home late at times. While I was making ends meet on my reports, Goldie was not shy about flying off her favorite ledge and sitting importantly on my head. From time to time, I would run into the ladies in the neighborhood, who would get more and more insistent in asking why I hadn't called any of them back. After hearing me explain that I was swamped with work and had little time for dating, Perky Josie took the initiative and asked me out herself. Josie became the third woman I went out with at my new place of residence. It was a Friday night, and first we had dinner and then went dancing. To be honest, I'm such a dancer that compared to me, even a leering bear would take the prize. Josie, however, didn't seem at all bothered by my clumsiness. She even turned down several unsolicited invitations to dance from other, much fitter guys. That made me very happy. However, all I got from Josie at the end of that evening was a handshake and a, thanks, it was fun. When I got home from my date, Goldie greeted me pretty calmly. I don't think she even chirped judgmentally at me once that weekend. Apparently, I hadn't crossed some invisible red line, so she was pleased with my behavior. That all changed the following Friday night when Josie and I had our second date. This time, the agenda included a great dinner followed by a trip to the movies. In my opinion, it went very well. At least before entering her apartment, Josie gave me a hug and a peck on the cheek, thanking me for a great evening. When I got back to my apartment, I was greeted by a loud and annoyed riot on the ship. I didn't feel any guilt, for I had left Goldie with fresh water and a full plate of seeds before I left. So what's eating you? Maybe another dapper hooligan's got his balls on you? Cheerer, fwow, cheerer, fwow, cheer ik schwip, fwip, fur, fur, cheerer, churik, fuit. Few, 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 few. Ah, never mind, I'm going to bed. I'll be damned if I didn't find a bomb of bird droppings in my hair this morning. However, I didn't say a word to the night terrorist. Goldie was already waiting for me on the kitchen table. She'd shown up to confront me as if I'd come home late and drunk last night. And now she needed a reasonable explanation for my negligence. She was giving me the round eye with her head tilted, with her wings at her sides. Chirk, she barked and swished her tail a couple times. You're a chirp, you little shit. I fed you yesterday. Well, what ruffled your feathers again? Again, the tail pirouetted furiously. Fur, 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 fur. And then an unprintable cheerick before it fluttered off the table into the bedroom and out into the open. Well, I hope I've learned my lesson firmly whatever lesson I should have learned. Much to my surprise, during my traditional weekend run, 
I was joined by Laura and Nancy. We chatted about how things were going with work for me and each of the ladies. Both made it clear that they would love to have dinner and a movie like we had with Josie. Sounds like fun. Let me make sure I got your numbers right. I winked at my companions. First, I found Nancy's number in my contacts and called it right away. Is this Nancy? I asked. E yes, sir. What can I do for you? Well, ma'am, I'd like to take you out on a date Friday night. Pick me up at six, she giggled and showed the tip of her tongue to Laura standing next to her. I then called Laura, whose ringtone changed to one magical evening. The girl answered simply, hello? twirling a curl of hair on the finger of her free hand. May I speak to Laura? Who's asking for her? It's Stefano. I can call back if it's a bad time. Hold on a second, I'll get her. Both girls giggled, turning slightly to the side and casting mischievous glances at me as I waited. It's Laura, the receiver finally answered with a laughing voice. Hi, Laura. My name is Stefano. I've asked you out every day for the past six weeks, and this time I won't take no for an answer, I announced sternly and firmly. A shocked Nancy immediately pulled away from Laura and shrieked, What? He asked you out on a date? N Laura instantly blushed and desperately shook her head. No, he didn't. This is the first time. Hastily hitting off, Laura pounced on me. Nancy got Friday, so I get Saturday. Do you understand, Mr. Stefano? Yes, ma'am. Saturday, this Saturday, six o'clock, sharp as a tack. No excuses, I reported solemnly, clicking my missing sneaker heels. Laura smiled and stood on tiptoe, kissing me on the cheek. Just the way Lynn always did. Nancy followed her friend's lead, kissing me sensuously on the other cheek. Friday night with Nancy was interesting. She proved to be a very assertive lady and was not shy about asking personal questions. Being a somewhat reserved person by nature, I felt out of place answering most of them. Trying to get me to relax, Nancy took a moment to turn my head with her hands and gave me a juicy wet kiss with tongue penetration. I'm not going to lie by saying I didn't enjoy it, but events were moving too fast for me to feel comfortable enough. The hug at the end of the evening was accompanied by a firm embrace on Nancy's part and an erotic groping of my ass. After so many months of abstinence, I showed reciprocal activity but I wish I hadn't. An enthusiastic Nancy again invited me to go out Sunday night, but this time I lied to her, telling her that I had an online conference scheduled for the day after tomorrow, and afterward I needed to write a detailed report for management. So as not to appear a complete ass in Nancy's eyes, I suggested we get out on another date a week later, the following Friday. Upon my return to the home nest, Goldie wasted no time in hovering around me, flying back and forth anxiously and chirping what appeared to be valuable instructions directly into my ears. If I was in a deep mine, I'd definitely be worried. A sunny and cheery Saturday morning found me wiping a new batch of bird crap off my head. Goldie, bleep, what is wrong with you? I screamed. Cherick! Chirp your tail, stop this terrorism now, or I'll take your seeds away from you. Hop, hop, fur. In a cheerick, 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 and then flying out the bedroom window. I don't know if that was a final dapper warning to leave her seeds alone and keep her grubby human paws to herself, but something I didn't want to risk. I had to make sure to leave a full plate of seeds and a saucer of fresh water again. I have yet to live with this rabid black-tailed marquise. As awkward as Friday night with Nancy was, Saturday night with Laura turned out to be awesome. I felt completely at ease with her. At first, she was visibly embarrassed and kept some distance between us. By the end of the evening, she was not just holding my hand, but, you could say, clutching it fervently. A sweet kiss on the cheek and Laura's gentle embrace ended our first evening together. My heart was pounding frantically, and I didn't want to part with this wonderful girl. When I got home, Goldie was sitting nonchalantly on the kitchen table, nibbling her seeds and drinking water. 
Not a single scolding tweet toward me, surprisingly enough. Not a single word was spoken between us that evening. Already lying in bed and being unable to sleep, I couldn't stand it and sent Laura a message inviting her to meet again next Saturday. The reply came almost instantly. She answered yes and added a smiley face with heart eyes. Apparently, Laura couldn't sleep that night either. Sunday morning, I woke up to Goldie sitting on my bedside table. Instead of quietly eyeballing me as usual, Goldie chirped quietly a few times and then headed out into the wild. The conditioner in the form of liquid bird droppings was not found in my hair this time. Well, well. My Friday night date with Nancy didn't go too well. I decided to leave after purposely getting into a political argument with her. Although I actually agreed with her, I used this little spat as an appropriate opportunity to end our relationship. When I got home, Goldie didn't say anything to me at first, not until I climbed into bed, but then she flopped down on the bedside table and spent the next ten minutes talking to me with her instructive chirping. When I found two flecks of bird droppings in my hair on Saturday morning, I wasn't even surprised. Goldie, another one of your bird crap shenanigans? You're not getting any seeds today, and that's it. No response. As I walked around the apartment, Goldie watched me intently from upstairs without making a sound. Perhaps she was getting laryngitis from having spent so long and persistently wiggled something into my brain the night before. Saturday night with Laura left me with a pounding heart again. It reminded me so much of our early dates with Lynn when I couldn't wait to hear her sweet voice again. When I got back from the date, Goldie still hadn't gotten her chirp back, and she had a poop shortage. On Sunday, I woke up to a subdued bird looking down at me from my nightstand. So are you finally happy now? I muttered. <sighs> Cheer, Crick. Good. I think I'll ask Laura out again. Chirp! Cheek, cheek! Uh-oh. Well... I'm glad you agree. I stretched my sleep-dry lips into a sort of smile and closed my eyes again. My dates with Laura moved forward and began to escalate into sessions of intense petting. Even though I would get home well past midnight, Goldie was still awake and waiting for me each time, sometimes hanging from the curtain rod and sometimes hopping up and pacing the kitchen table. She seemed to have trained me well enough that I remembered to leave her a daily batch of seeds and fresh water before I left. The first time Laura came to my house, Goldie was lurking, sitting quietly on the curtain rod. I warned both girls, Goldie and Laura, that they were to meet each other. Laura thought I was joking, but quickly recovered from the shock of seeing Goldie staring at her in person. While I cooked dinner, heating the food in the microwave, Laura looked around, studying the feng shui principles of my bachelor pad. She picked through knickknacks, then rummaged through books, and finally a lone painting on my mantelpiece captured her attention. Who is that beautiful woman? She asked, picking it up in front of her and looking at the framed photograph. That's Lynn, a very special woman to me, I said softly. She was a nurse and died of the virus last year. It still pains me to talk about it. Carefully putting the photograph back in its place, Laura remarked, It says, Always and Forever Goldie. Is that why you named your little bird Goldie? Yes. My voice broke as my throat constricted in a spasm and tears blurred my vision. Laura came up behind me and without saying a word, hugged me. It took me a few minutes to come to my senses. Well, life goes on. Dinner led to a night of passion. For me, it was the first time it had happened since the last time Lynn and I had loved each other. After hugs and passionate tongue-in-cheek kisses, our hands continued to roam freely as we explored our new partner. Although I was fully ready to move into flexible and active exercises, I still took my time. Licking and kissing every available naked part of her body, I got Laura to the point where she was trembling with anticipation, taut as a string. And then we threw ourselves into a whirlpool of pleasure, giving ourselves to each other with all our ardent passion. Fortunately, I was able to last longer than her, so our first intimacy ended only after Laura shook the bed violently, wriggling and experiencing her greatest pleasure. Shortly afterward, I followed her. 
As is usually the case with first meetings, slightly calmed down, we pressed against each other and almost in unison confessed that everything had been wonderful. And I was absolutely not lying. That long night had been really great, containing not only two nightly fireworks of love, but also another one that happened just before dawn. And in the morning, I woke up to Laura's joyful voice. Good morning, Goldie. Instead of the loud chirp usually directed at me, Goldie whispered, chirk, 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 before flapping her wings and flying out into the wild. I had little doubt I'd see bird shit in my hair, but surprise, I didn't. Perhaps it was my threat to take the air pirate's favorite seeds away from her. Good morning to you too, lover. This time, the smiling Laura was addressing me. Ready for another round? After showering after my morning bedtime exercise and getting dressed, I found Laura by scent in the kitchen where she was brewing coffee. This morning's news, the treacherous Goldie had turned her back on me. I've, you know, been feeding her for months, and she's never once sat on my hand in all that time. Laura put a few seeds in her palm, raised her hand a few inches, and Goldie immediately leapt off the ledge and landed softly on her outstretched hand. Goldie, you traitor. I've tried this a dozen times and it's no use. You, you shameless defector, I exclaimed, amazed to the core at the woman's bird-like double-crossing. Giggling, Laura clasped the sunflower seed between her lips and tilted her head sideways and downward, stretching her lips slightly forward at which point Goldie jumped up and snatched the seed as if to kiss Laura. Wow, I can't believe. Hey, you two, are you two conspiring on purpose? Goldie has very high standards that you obviously don't meet, announced a radiantly happy Laura. Afterward, Goldie and Laura, chirping and laughing, teased me with their lovemaking antics for a long time to come. I didn't want the situation to get out of hand, but at the same time, I didn't want to let Laura go. Three months into our relationship, I proposed to her. Laura responded with only one condition. If you agree to start a family right after we get married, then I accept your proposal. We sealed our verbal pact with a heated kiss. Well, actually, it wasn't just a kiss. It was much more than that. Okay, okay. I'll admit we had a wild night of passionate lovemaking. So much so that I even had to take the morning off to recover. Ah, ma, life is good again. In the morning, Goldie sneezed something obviously approving about our nightly fun and flew off to do her bird business. Taking the picture from the fireplace, Laura sternly demanded, It's time to tell me a story. If we're going to get married, we shouldn't have secrets from each other. I wasn't sure I could take it. Give it to me here. Let's cuddle while I tell you the story. Laura snuggled in, snuggling up against me and tucking her legs under her shapely ass. Lynn and I met in college, I began the story. Until I met you, I firmly believed she was my soulmate. I proposed to her at Christmas, and we set the wedding for June. Laura slid her arm behind my back, put her arm around me, and pulled me even tighter. Lynn, she went to nursing school and was allowed to take her exams early so she could help patients in hospitals. I paused as my throat had gone into spasm, and now I could only barely squeeze the words out of my mouth. Laura ran her hand over my face, quickly brushing the moisture from my eyes with the back of her hand. But the tears were quickly reappearing. Pulling myself together, I continued. Lynn had asthma, which proved fatal to her when she contracted the virus. She tested positive, and it was before thousands of people had even died. Lynn had no idea that something had gone wrong. No matter how hard they tried to stay safe, several other healthcare workers in the red zone next to her became sick as well. Since we weren't married yet, I couldn't see Lynn all the time and monitor her condition. Lynn's parents were stuck on a cruise ship and had no way to monitor her health either. It wasn't until I saw her name on the list of deceased healthcare providers that I had confirmation. It wasn't until months later that Lynn's parents tracked down her grave. Now it was my turn to join Laura, wiping away the tears rolling down my face. I lovingly called her Goldie because of her light golden hair. See that birthmark on her neck right there? Lynn was always very self-conscious about it, and I told her it was some kind of cross-hatched spot to make it easier for vampires to bite her. She laughed then, 
and I didn't pay any attention to it, so Lynn stopped trying to hide it with makeup and started showing it off. Goldie rustled through the air past us and landed on the kitchen table. Laura followed her flight and took a deep breath. Your little feathered friend seems to have a birthmark, too. There, there, look, there's that little black dot under her beak. Yeah, that's why it was so easy for me to name her Goldie. I nodded, putting my arm around Laura's shoulders. We sat quietly and watched Goldie nibble her seeds, occasionally lifting her head and looking at us with her black, beady eyes. When she had finished her meal, she chirped something to us before flitting off to her favorite spot on the curtain rod. There's a beautiful gazebo pavilion in the park across from our apartment complex. Laura and I decided to save some money and have our wedding ceremony there. When everything was set up and everyone was ready, Laura's father walked his daughter down the aisle. As he handed her hand to me, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a yellow bird approaching. Sure enough, it was Goldie, landing softly on the back of one of the empty chairs. Laughs and giggles were heard in the crowd gathered behind us. Laura instinctively turned around to see who or what was disrupting her most important ceremony in life. When Laura looked at me with questioning curiosity, I whispered, It's Goldie, and pointed sideways at our motley friend sitting importantly in a chair. Laura smiled radiantly when she saw her, and my fiancé's eyes moistened. And Goldie remained in her seat until I had finished the traditional kiss of the bride, which was received with murmurs of approval by everyone in the room, and only then did she leave. When I pulled away from Laura and cast my gaze over the rows of chairs, our yellow-breasted guest was no longer there. Goldie's mission was complete. At the reception following the ceremony, several people showed us photos and videos they had taken of the yellow bird that had intervened and blown up our wedding with her presence. Laura stopped taking birth control right after the wedding, but a few weeks after our honeymoon, she was still having her period. Of course, in bed, we were both trying our best, but I wasn't making a fuss about the fact that we weren't having any luck so far. Goldie and Laura were still best friends, and I was still Mr. Outsider in their company. Well, at least I got a lot of cute pictures of both of them. After Laura started her fertile cycle again, we did it every night. And every morning, Goldie was there to greet us, until the day she suddenly disappeared. It was after one night that seemed really special to me, for Laura and me. The morning after that particular night, we didn't hear Goldie's long, familiar chirping. In my heart, I knew that day would come sooner or later but I still felt a kind of desolation, as if I had lost a close, kindred spirit. I hadn't said anything that first day when Goldie didn't show up, and Laura didn't know what to say either. When a week passed without Goldie, I went into the woods and cried. For the second time in the last two years, tears rolled down my cheeks and I had to whisper, goodbye, looking up at the swaying tree crowns and fluttering leaves, unable to say goodbye in person to the one I cared so much about. Laura was grieving in her own way. We hardly talked to her about Goldie, but we were both very hurt and sad. We just sat there and hugged in silence. There are two words a young boy is afraid to hear, but this time was different. A few weeks after Goldie left us, Laura gave us a warning. I have a delay. My gloomy mood quickly changed, fueled by a burst of hope. Really? You think you might be pregnant? Tomorrow I'm going to buy a pregnancy test kit and then we'll see, Laura promised without hiding her own hope and impatience. The next morning at half past 11, I received a message. Call me, immediately. My stomach clenched nervously. God, please let it be something good. Stefano, you're going to be a daddy, came my young wife's jubilant voice through the phone and her laughter through her tears. Hooray! We are going to be parents very soon in just a few months. Gosh, we had so much fun celebrating this awesome news. Every time Laura started having morning sickness, it was a real worry for me. I love her too much, and deep down I realized that if anything happened to her, it would kill me. But thank God, things seemed to be going as they should for a young wife. We attended every doctor's appointment together and looked at all the scans of our future baby. Tests showed that we were expecting a baby girl. We chose our desired names for the newborn and wrote them down. 
Laura wanted her choice to remain a secret until the birth was successful. It's hard to explain how slowly time dragged on for both of us. I was certainly on a constant state of stress. Having already endured so much grief and heartache that it would be enough to last a lifetime, I wasn't sure I could bear to suffer again if something suddenly went wrong. When Laura's water broke one day, I panicked at first. However, I managed to overcome my momentary confusion, quickly pulled myself together and successfully delivered Laura to the hospital. Natural childbirth was an ordeal for me. Laura was exhausted, struggling with excruciating pain, and all I could do was let her cling to my arm and mentally encourage my young wife. Then the miracle happened. Our long-awaited baby girl was born. It took the staff about a minute to examine her and confirm that we had a healthy little girl. The maternity ward nurse was the first to notice, exclaiming, Oh my gosh, look at her hair. Your little girl is a natural blonde. Apparently trying to reassure us, the attending physician watching the birth added, We can easily remove that birthmark from her neck. Laura, who had already put the baby to her breast and was watching her smack, smack, smack with a motherly smile, brightened up, raised her sparkling eyes to me, and then spoke. Do you realize that it's been exactly 40 weeks since we last saw Goldie? Stefano, I want to name our little girl Goldie Lynn. Without any objection on my part, our blonde ball of joy was christened Goldie Lynn. Epilogue. Goldie Lynn still has a birthmark on her neck, and her favorite stuffed toy is an American dandy. Laura, a young mommy, drew a birthmark on the stuffed animal with a black marker, just like the one on our matchmaker, Goldie the Feathered One. We still live in my fourth floor apartment, and I still leave the window looking out on the park open. Every now and then when I go out for my morning run, I hear that familiar chirp among the tree branches. Even though I know the chances are slim, I still lift my head and look up. I have to. Maybe Goldie is the one greeting me today with her chirpy chirp. We have a lot of pictures hanging on our wall. Here are a few pictures of our little ball of parental happiness. Many of them are of Goldie Lynn with Laura, but there are a few of me hugging my most favorite women in life. And here's our mantelpiece. On the left is a framed picture of Lynn. Right next to it is a laughing Goldie Lynn taking a slice of banana from the lips of a smiling Laura. And even a little to the right is a picture of Goldie, bowing her furry head, examining the lens from her favorite curtain rod. And finally, a photo of sly Goldie snatching a seed from Laura's lips. And to the right of the picture frames, I left a saucer full of seeds on the mantel. You'd have to be crazy to think all of those things had something to do with each other. Well, you can think of me as just that. Crazy romantic, I don't mind. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's a little girl with a mark on her neck caught in my pant leg who wants me to chase after her again, pretending to be a vampire. When she runs away from me on her little legs with her funny stomping and gleeful laughter, it's very infectious. How wonderful it is that sooner or later true happiness can be caught up, hugged tightly and pressed right to my heart.